I had the very great fortune to be a uh, student of Abdus Salam. Uh, I began uh, being his student in 1973, and then I did some courses, and so I really began in 1974. That was the time when uh, Wes and Zemino had just written their classic paper, and uh, supersymmetry became a subject of interest to rather a small group of Europeans. So when I finished my courses, I went to see uh, Professor Salam and uh, wondering what I was going to do. And uh, to some, my, my surprise, he asked me what I wanted to do. I said that uh, infinities in quantum field theory were rather disgusting and that I'd like to work on general relativity. But uh, rather than explain how stupid this was, he suggested there wasn't much to do in uh, general relativity and that um, I might look at his uh, recent paper. He didn't call it his humble paper, I think, on this occasion, but it was the paper he wrote with Strath D that discovered superspace. Of course, within days, I was working on infinities in quantum field theory. I realized with hindsight that uh, even though I was a humble student, he'd used his great charm and diplomacy on me, which he'd used so effectively to gain these uh, many things he achieved in life. Well, Salam, you never knew when you'd see him next. You walked into Imperial, and then the door would just be a little bit open, and then you knew he was in. So you'd knock on the door, and he was always free. You could go in, and he was always extremely cheerful and friendly, and it seemed as if he didn't have a care in the world, and there was a lot of time but uh, I didn't realize that he was achieving so many things in the rest of the world. So at that time, the problem was to break supersymmetry. And uh, it was thought that you could do this with radiative corrections. In other words, you'd calculate the effective potential at one loop. So Salam and Strath D, they produced all these models. So Salam would come with a model and it my, was my job to calculate the radiative corrections. The models weren't very successful, and I think uh, Bob and I can remember not particularly fond memories of working with a 26 by 26 determinant, trying to diagonalize it, only to find the roots were imaginary, when they were supposed to be real. But uh, this wasn't a problem, because uh, when I saw uh, Professor Salam again, he always had a new model, a more exciting model, that I could work on. Eventually I realized that uh, if supersymmetry was preserved, the effective potential vanished. So in effect, we'd spent quite a long time calculating zero. It meant that uh, supersymmetry was not broken by radiative corrections, and uh, to this day we don't really know how supersymmetry is broken. It also was the uh, led to the understanding that supersymmetry solves the technical hierarchy problem, which we were alluded to this morning. Well, I think you can look back in your life and uh, you can see certain events that um, changed it. And I think uh, having Abdus Salam as my supervisor was one of them. Well, what I want to talk to you about is uh, strings and brains. Well, quantum field theory is uh, based on point particles, and for the electroweak and nuclear strong forces, it's been enormously successful. But for gravity, we know it's inconsistent. Now, supersymmetry and strings, oh yes, I could try using this, oh yeah. Supersymmetry and strings are thought to provide a, a solution to this uh, um, problem. But the problem is that, uh, well, in the first advent of string theory, which was discovered in late 60s, in a series of brilliant papers, by the early 70s, they'd calculated string scattering for all loops and all amplitudes, all legs. But the problem was they didn't know how to do non-perturbative string theory, and that's actually more or less still true today. One island of knowledge that we have are the supergravity theories. They account for string theory and brains at low energy, 
And actually that was how we came to do, think about brains. The trouble is that although we know a lot about the quantum theory, perturbative quantum theory of strings, for a single brain we had no idea how to quantize it at all. So in effect we've wandered into a kind of no man's land. So what I want to explain is that maybe a, well, a first step to solving this is to find what are the symmetries of this underlying theory. So that more or less says what I said. One important point is that these supergravity theories, as has been mentioned before, had a surprising property. This was discovered by uh, Kremer and Julia in about 1980. It turned out that, that there were these exceptional symmetries embedded in the supergravities. And uh, these were thought to be rather a coincidence and just a concept of the fact that, well, I'll explain it in a minute, these come out as you go down in dimension. So here are the supergravity theories. So I'm discussing theories with uh, maximal supergravity, which is about half of them. And when I say maximal, I mean there are, if you take the supersymmetry, how many parameters does it have in components? Well, it has 32. So here are the supergravity theories. So the maximum dimension you can have is 11, and this is 11-dimensional supergravity. And it has a metric, a three-form, and some spinners. So in most of this talk, I won't discuss the spinners. Now, you can take this theory. So it has Einstein plus the uh, poten usual potential for a three-form. And you can just say, well, I don't want it to depend on this 11th coordinate. And then you find another theory. So the indices are still going 1 to 11, but the dependence on the coordinates is on the 11th coordinate is not there. You find this theory called 2a. So that's what this arrow here means. Well, then you can do the same to get to 9 dimension, and you get this theory here. But actually, there's another supergravity called 2b in 10 dimensions. And uh, if you do the dimensional reduction here, you find you get the same theory, because this theory is unique in 9. So you can continue the process, say, to 4 dimension. And here, you find a theory with a graviton, some 70 scalars and 56 uh, vectors. And this one has this uh, Kremer-Julia symmetry, the E7. So you see, as you go down in dimension, here it was only SL2 times U1, and this was an important one, SL2R. But these are quite small groups, but as you go down, you get a, these large groups. And it was thought to be a quirk of this dimensional reduction. So what I'm going to say is these symmetries is not a quirk, and actually they live up here with a much, much bigger symmetry. So what is M-theory? Well, M-theory isn't a theory. It's just the set of connections, and they're best seen in this supergravity. You can go down by dimensional reduction, and because these theories are the same, you can do this, what's called this T-duality, relating this to this once they're reduced on a radius. Another connection in M-theory is this line here, which says if you decompactify, you go up to here, and in fact, uh, you can realize this is the limit of the strong coupling limit of this theory, but you've no idea what actually that is. Now, I'm discussing theories with 32 supersymmetries, that's these maximal ones, and as we saw, we had one in each dimension, but two in 10. So, it turns out there's some other theories. So, it turns out you can introduce a cosmological constant. So, as you know, that's a uh, just determinant E. So you can add it, say, to the four-dimensional theory, and then you can add all the terms which would preserve supersymmetry. So if I do this in 11, you find actually it doesn't work, and there's no such theory. If you do it in 2b, there's no such theory. But in 2a, that was this other 10-dimensional theory, there's just one possibility, and that's called this Romans theory. But as I go down, say to four, you find really there are a lot of new theories. So what I'm explaining here is, for these maximal supergravities, and so corresponding string theories, there's not just one of them, there's really a lot of them.
Okay. So what I'm going to do is unify all these theories. And for this we're going to do what seems like technical, but it's actually quite simple, a nonlinear realization of this group G, semi-direct product with L1. So in the first line we have the normal Lie algebra of G. And in the next line we have this representation L, and for every element in here we take a generator, LA, and this commutation relation with the G is just the representation matrix. And then for the else, we'll just take them to commute, although you could do something else. So you all know what this is, because if I take G to be the Lorentz group and L to be the translations, this is the Poincaré group. So the Lorentz with the translations give the translations. So that's this relation. So I want to do the nonlinear realization of this, and the nonlinear realization, you select a G and an L, and you also select a subgroup H. So it's very simple. You take some group element, a member of this, so since it has the generators R alpha, you have some parameters A alpha, and for L you have some parameters Z A, now it'll turn out that these are the coordinates of a space-time and these are the fields and they depend on that. So what is the nonlinear realization? Well, it's just the thing that's invariant under these transformations. So on the left you act with G0, so that's a ele group element here. And this is rigid, so it doesn't depend on these coordinates. And on the right you act with an H, that's this preferred subgroup, and this element here does depend on the coordinates. So this transformation H turns up here, so you can get rid of some of these A's. So let's do some examples. So if we take G equals H, because of what I just said, oh no, if G equals H, I can get this is an element of G, and this is an element of G too, so I can get rid of all these guys. So in that case, you're only left with the coordinates. And let's do an example. If we take G equals, sorry, this is G semi-direct product, L is Poincaré. So this is G is Lorentz, I meant to write here. And H is the Lorentz group. So that gauge away all the fields then you just have e to the x a p a, and then you calculate the transformations, those rigid ones, and this is just Minkowski space. Now let's do another one. Let's take g equals, uh, it's not written correct, this is g semi-direct product L, so we take the super Poincaré group here, and then we take the Lorentz group, all the fields have gone, we get the coordinates, so we have an x and a theta, and this is, of course, the famous uh, construction of Salam and Strathdee for superspace. This was the paper he handed to me. So now let's do another one. Let's suppose that we have uh, no L at all. So we just have G, e to the alpha r alpha, and the A's, we're going to do something artificial. We're just going to say the A's they're going to depend on a space-time, which isn't in the group. We just introduce it by hand. So here, the way to get the dynamics is we take the Cartan form, g minus 1 dg. So that transforms like this. Because under g goes to g0, g. The g0, this is g0, g. g0 minus 1, it cancels out. And g goes to g, h, it gives this. So we can split it into a part for the subgroup and a part not in the subgroup, that's the coset, and this bit is in the subgroup, so these p's transform covariantly, so the action we can write down is just trace of p squared. So where's some examples? Well, let's take this one at the bottom Let's take G to be SL2 and H to be SO2. 
So here you'd have uh, 3 minus 2 minus 1, that's two scalars, phi and chi. And this is actually, if you take the scalars in 2b, I said it has an SL2R symmetry. This is exactly how they're realized. And similarly, the scalars in supergravity in four dimension, we had this group E7, and then we had this SU8. So you get 70 scalars, and the actions in these cases are just like this. So let's take another group type. Let's take G to be SU2 times SU2 and H to the diagonal SU2. And then actually we get uh, three massless particles. And historically this was enormously important because this was actually how uh, they saw the pions collide in CERN. They could see what their interactions were. They did this construction here and they compared them with the interactions Okay, pions have a small mass, but modulo that point, they saw they were exactly the same. And this was how uh, some symmetries came into particle physics. Well, at least in the strong interaction. So now I want to do an analogy. <coughs> Goldstone theorem, which uh, Salam proved with uh, uh, Weinberg, Goldstone, and... Uh, no, there was somebody else. Just two. Okay. Um, if you have a, sponta a rigid symmetry group G that's spontaneously broken to H, they're dimension of G minus dimension of H, massless particles. And it's not a theorem, but generally the behavior of these particles is the nonlinear realization of G with local subgroup H. That's exactly what I've been going through. So in pion dynamics, you had SU2 times SU2 with subgroup SU2 diagonal, and that gave the pion dynamics. That's what I said. Of course, this was strong interactions, and actually the step to find the final theory, of course, was quarks. And this was a very long journey. We don't have a CERN, but we do have the supergravities. They describe the low energy behavior of strings and brains. So they're a sort of effective theory. And my, what I want to say is that the analog of this is E11. These are sort of, as I'll explain in more detail, the nonlinear realization of E11. And this, at low energy, this should be the fundamental theory. But just like this was an enormous leap, this is going to be a much bigger leap. So I want to explain in another way what I'm doing. So as I mentioned, these symmetries of Kremer and Julia were not thought to be fundamental. They were thought to be just a quirk of dimensional reduction. But what I proposed 14 years ago was that actually these and other symmetries were a symmetry in 11 and all the other theories. In other words, they lifted. So the way I did it, actually, was if we have, uh, in four dimensions, we have 70 scalars, and the local subgroup is SU8. So for each of these scalars, we have a generator in the nonlinear realization. And then you could say, well, what about the Vierbeins and the vectors? Let's give them generators. And then you'd find some bigger algebra. So let's go to 11. We have the metric. So let's introduce this generator has the same, because in the group element, in the nonlinear realization, the generator goes with the field, so they have the same indices. And I have a th three form in 11 dimensions, so I introduce this. So I get a, an algebra here. It was a very ugly algebra. But actually, by uh, I said, let's take a katz moody algebra, and then it turned out to be E11. Okay. Well, I have to tell you what a uh, Katz-Moody algebra is, and uh, that's quite too complicated for here. But I can explain it from by explaining what is the history of Lie algebras. So, for physicists, Lie algebras, well, they came out of groups. 
And if you have a Lie algebra, you can find a set of commuting generators, they're the H's, and you can find, diagonalize the rest of the generators, they're the E alpha, and they're diagonal in the sense that H with E alpha gives alpha. So the Al Lie algebra is characterized by these vectors called the roots. Now, rather than talk about the roots, you can talk about a basis for the roots, they're called the simple roots. And uh, you can also construct the scalar products of the roots and construct what's called the Cartan matrix. And then, as you know, you can draw a diagram which reconstructs the Cartan matrix. So these physicists, well, mathematicians actually, had all these groups. They followed this procedure, and they came out with a set of Cartan matrices. Now, when they looked at these matrices, so they had the uh, Cartan, actually, killing list, killing did all this, uh, a, B, C, D, E, not E, actually. So, obviously, the diagonals are two, and it turns out they're negative integers off the diagonal, and the zeros are symmetric, and actually, these matrices here are positive definite, so for any V, this is positive. Now, when they thought about this, they realized, actually, there were some group, some algebras they were missing, and this was actually how, for example, E8 was discovered. They had these properties, and then they looked for algebras that did it. So E8, E7, E6. Now, that was long ago, but in the 1950s, uh, Serre looked at this, and he found a way to go back from the Cartan matrix to the Lie algebra. See, the Lie algebras can be very complicated, but the Cartan matrix only has a matrix equal to the rank. It's a, if you have R H's, this is an R by R matrix. So he said, if you take the Cartan matrix and you take these three E's, three F's, and three H's, those H's are those H's, and these turn out to be the simple positive roots, and these the negative simple roots, and you took, look at the algebra generated by that, and you have some relations which I'm not writing down, then actually you can go from the Cartan matrix to the Lie algebra. So that was, say, in 1950. And what did Katz and Moody do? Well, they just said, we'll just drop this last condition. And that was Katz-Moody algebras. So E11 is a Katz-Moody algebra. I've explained that for these algebras, once I write down the Dinkin diagram, I've told you what it is. So here is the Dinkin diagram of E11. You see that if I was to delete these three, it's got E8 here. Now, it turns out that for Katz-Moody algebras, to investigate them has proved very difficult, and actually there's no listing for any Katz-Moody algebra of the generators or the representations. But in doing this work, we found ways of uh, getting to grips with parts of these algebras. So what we do is, for example, here we could delete node 11, then we'd have 10 dots in a row, and this would be the algebra A10 or SL11. So what we do is we take E11 and we found ways to de decompose it into SL11. So this is like taking the three of SU3 and decomposing it into SU2. So if you do that, then deleting this gives SL11, and they're the generators of SL11. And then there's something called a level, which is preserved, which is the number of up minus down indices over three. So this has level zero. At level one, you find this object with three indices, six indices, eight indices, and another one, and on you go. So I just want to reassure you that at least up to level four, this algebra is written down. So this is the algebra of SL11. And this thing here, this is level one. Level one with level one gives level two, and the only generator at level two is this one. So you can carry on like this.
Now remember, I'm going to do the nonlinear realization of G, semi direct product L, so I need a representation. So what I'm going to take is the representation, the fundamental one associated with node 1. So that just has a highest weight whose scalar product with the alphas is 0. These are the simple roots, except if it's 1. So it's the representation associated with that node. So if I delete this one here, it would be the representation associated with these 10 dots, SL11, and that's a vector. So actually, that's why it begins with the PA. And the next thing you find is a two form, a five form, and then on it goes. And because I said it before, you can write down the algebra. This is the, before I had R alpha with LA gives the representation matrix times LA. So it's easy to work out what this is. Now, this is the, uh, you could think of this as the charge associated with a particle and the charge associated with a two brain and a five brain because you, these are the same as the central charges in the supersymmetry algebra. But more generally, there's extremely good evidence that all the charges in uh, strings and brains are somehow included in this multiplet. And you see they start to get very complicated. So uh, this may appear complicated, but it's not really. So I'm just going to do exactly what I did. This was in 2003 uh, for the uh, nonlinear realization of G, which is L E11, semi-direct product L1. So the group element has a bit in the L and a bit in the E. So the bit in the L, we found what they were. So we have XAPA. And here we have a X1, X, a, XA1, A2, ZA1, A2, and similarly here, and on it goes. And for the fields, here we have the field HABKAB. -B. This was the generator. Then I had a three form and a six form. So these fields are going to depend on these coordinates. So you see, I've got a generalized space time. What we thought was space time has a lot of friends. And these fields depend on them. So it's an intimidating system. Now, one th good feature, immediately good feature, is that you see the fields, well, we get the normal coordinate of space-time, and then we get, this will turn out, this is, could be the graviton, this is the three-form, and actually 11 dimensions can equally well be formulated with a six-form. So we find the fields of 11-dimensional supergravity and the coordinate. Well, to calculate the dynamics, we do it more or less what you did for the pions. So for the pions, you didn't have an L bit, so you just got this bit here. So this is in E11. And this is uh, the bit in L. And this is, turns out I have a generalized space-time and this is the Virbein on the generalized space-time. So I don't want to go into it, but you can compute all these objects. So the Virbein is just the normal Virbein. That's e to the h. And then it gets more complicated components here. And here, you, for example, this one, the one that goes with, has an A index here and a BC index, so that's the gravity. See, he's, he's something you might think about as gravity. And the next one up, where you take the R with three indices, that's just the derivative of the three form. And they have a transformation, because uh, this Cartan form goes like h to the minus 1 nu h plus h to the minus 1 dh. So you can work all this out. So I made this suggestion in uh, 2003, but uh, in the last few months, we finally managed to work it out. It looks very simple, but this nonlinear realization has uh, a number of subtleties, which it's only recently got to grips with. 
So you do this calculation, and uh, you find that the dynamics of all these fields, at least the low-level ones, and you hear that you must keep the coordinates, you find it's unique. And actually, when you truncate away the coordinates to be just the usual one and the usual fields of supergravity, then you find the exact equations of motion of 11-dimensional supergravity. So, I started with the Dinkin diagram of E11. I followed a pretty, didn't make any real assumptions, not many, hardly any. And uh, I ended up with uh, supergravity. This is a bit of a puzzle, because 11-dimensional supergravity is constructed using supersymmetry. But I never mentioned supersymmetry here at all. E11 seems to know a lot about supersymmetry, and it certainly leads uniquely to this supergravity theory. Okay. So, the nonlinear realization of this thing is a unified theory. So, I showed it had 11 dimensional supergravity. But if you want the theory in d dimensions, I deleted this node here and had 10 dots. But what about deleting this node, say node 4? Here you'd have 3 dots, which would be GL4, and this would be E7. And if you delete node D, you get SLD with E11 minus D. So this bit is associated with the gravity, and these are these cremer julia symmetries. And if you do it, you find the correct content, and uh, it's inevitable that you'll find uniquely the, 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 gravity, the supergravity theory in d dimensions. So this theory has accounted for all the different supergravities in the different dimensions. But I also mentioned that they were only part of what the maximal supergravities were. So for example, uh, I had these gauged supergravities. So that was where you took a supergravity, added the cosmological constant, and found out what the result was. But I won't go into it, but it turns out this theory knows all about these, and they're also encoded in it. So, roughly speaking, you find a field which has uh, d minus 1 indices. That has a certain representation of these groups. And if you take this action, and then you would find out that the field equation automatically tells you that f is a constant, so it is a cosmological constant. So for every one of these found in there, you get one of these theories. And there you can do most of it on the back of an envelope, but it took people 20 years to classify these. And uh, actually, this agrees completely. Now, I explained that the maximal supergravity theories are the low-energy effective actions for strings and brains. But there were quite a number of these. And uh, now we realize that this theory puts them all in a single unified theory. But we also know there are effects in here which are beyond the supergravities, which are in the underlying theory of strings and brains. So I think it's inescapable that the theory of strings, low energy effective action of strings and brains is actually this theory, and it has an E11 symmetry. So, you can ask, in here, we had the usual coordinate and the usual fields, but there are an infinite number of coordinates and an infinite number of fields. So now we have to ask the question, what are these infinite fields and coordinates doing? Well, quite a number of these fields, we know actually what they are. They're to do with duality symmetries, and some of them are like this fields, which are actually giving new physics. But our suspicion, strong suspicion, is actually these aren't new degrees of freedom. But they do, like this one, have physical effects. The answer to what are all the coordinates, that's a little more subtle. Uh, I, I think the question of these, these coordinates are extremely interesting, because if you believe in the supergravities, well, they are the low energy effective action for strings and brains up until this work, 
you're more or less going to believe in these coordinates. So these coordinates should be physical. So you shouldn't just try and get rid of them, you should have some physical idea of what to do with them. One way to think about it is that for the gravity, it turns out there's a connection. For the gravity, HAB, you have the coordinate XA. And for the three form, you have a coordinate XA1, A2. So you can think of Einstein theory curved space-time, and that was in this th coordinate XA. But the three form has his own sort of uh, physics, and he's associated with the coordinate XA1, A2. I think you can think about, you know, this is a sort of theory, it's low energy effective action, and we see that it has near 11 symmetry. It, it's sort of a pre-run, it's a sort of, I think, a first step, first solid step on what the underlying theory of strings and brains really is. And in the underlying theory of strings and brains, we're not going to have any space-time, that's gone away. And you should think of these just like you have an effective action where you have a lot of fields, and that describes an underlying theory. You should think of these coordinates as a type of effective analog of an effective action that's describing space-time before it dissolves. Okay, I'll finish that. Oh, last. Where are the fermions? All right. So, um, the fermions you can add as a matter representation of the H, which is the Cartan involution. So uh, the E10 crowd started doing this first, and uh, they found uh, certain things working. And uh, you could add the fermions all over here, and uh, it'll work pretty much okay. Actually, uh, I think that's a little artificial, and uh, maybe there's a better way of doing the fermions. But at least as a first step, it'll... Uh... Not so beautiful. <laughs> um, well, I have an idea. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Kelly has a question. Yeah. Action. Are, are you seeing operators as well, or is everything just being a set of fields and then you, you get the operators by eliminating fields? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. This was some type of um, correspondence, or uh, it wasn't a clear correspondence, I don't think. It was more a sort of coincidence between the uh, higher R's and uh, some of the levels. I mean, it could well hold here. I just haven't looked at it. But I could make a comment about the higher order terms in the effective action. Please do. Yeah. Uh, you might think that uh, in the quantum theory, these E11 would become uh, discrete. Actually, the Lorentz group is part of it, so it becomes discrete too. Um, you might think that it all goes away. But actually, we know that the higher order corrections to supersgravity theory have r to some power times an automorphic form. And when you start looking at it, you can see uh, the exact ingredients going into the nonlinear realization written all over it. For example, the automorphic form involves exactly this uh, g in the nonlinear realization. And uh, actually, it involves g, and not only that, oh dear. It involves the uh, L1 representation, at least truncated down to the type of things they're thinking. So you might imagine that uh, there's some type of E11 automorphic form, and it really does the job. What's the bottom line? Is it discretized or not? Sorry? What's the bottom line? Is it discretized or not? In the fundamental theory, E11 will be discretized. But my, what I'm saying is that E11 is a uh, symmetry of the effective action, and there it's continuous. But in the full quantum theory, it'd have to be discrete. 